When the Rolling Stones played Hyde Park in a huge free concert on the 5th of July 1969, they did so with erstwhile leader and founder Brian Jones a mere two days dead. In a classic case of death by misadventure, Jones had been fished from the bottom of his swimming pool at his home in Sussex. Mick Jagger eulogised Jones from the stage in a swirl of butterflies, reading from Shelley's Adonais. Peace, peace, he is not dead, he doth not sleep, he hath awakened from the dream of life. Tis we who, lost in stormy visions, keep with phantoms an unprofitable strife, and in a mad trance strike with our spirit's knife invulnerable nothings. We decay like corpses in a charnel. Fear and grief convulse us and consume us day by day, and cold hopes swarm like worms within our living clay. The one remains, the many change and pass. Heaven's light forever shines, earth shadows fly. Life, like a dome of many-coloured glass, stains the white radiance of eternity until death tramples it to fragments. Die if thou wouldst be with that which thou dost seek. Follow where all is fled. Perhaps had Jagger not been so numb to the real irony of the occasion and sought a truer, less romantic view of Jones, for Jones was not a romantic figure, he may well have chosen, better, the same poet's Ozymandias. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, Boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Of the architects of the law of rock music in the 1960s, Brian Jones is usually left off the roll of honour. Undeservingly, for he was the core, the binding element around which a unique and tightly integrated cadre of musicians gravitated. When things were in place, he christened them the Rolling Stones. It was his guitar that gave them the drive that they still at least attempt to emulate today. It was his spiderweb of that guitar, baleful harmonica and stinging slide guitar that first stamped the identity of the band. Later, during the golden pomp of the band from 1965 to 67, as Jagger and Keith Richards developed pretensions of expanding their sound to match the Beatles and their American rivals, it was Jones who delivered the tonal colour and instrumental flair that, while it was just so much frippery in service of a poor imitation, at least kept them in the game. A harp here, a dulcimer there, recorder, mellotron or a marimba, sitars, saxophone, 15 instruments all up, which took good songs and made them better records, or in some cases took mundane songs and made them sound better than they were. In the late 1960s, though, some incipient sadness had come over Jones. His band and his girlfriend usurped from him by Keith Richards, who'd also emerged from his 1967 drug bust, his reputation as an outlaw rock and roll hero enhanced while Jones was psychologically destroyed by his and its attendant humiliating trial. Sidelined as an instrumentalist, as again Richards began to assume the 60s guitar hero mould when the band decided to get back to the kind of basics they'd practice when they were Jones's band, his almost constant state of drug-addled, brandy-besotted stupefaction and death, a death so young that of all of the great martyrs of 1960s music, he was the first of the gang to die. Brian Jones was born in Cheltenham, about 100 miles northwest of London, in 1942. A cheerful and precocious child, his musical parents, his father was a piano teacher, introduced to him at first classical music, then the blues, then jazz. He played the clarinet in the school orchestra and later taught himself saxophone and guitar. After fathering his first child, he dropped out of school, excelling in physics and chemistry, but tellingly failing biology, and went busking in Northern Europe until the money and charity ran out and he retreated to England in 1959. Two years and four more children later, Jones, who had been playing in a London band with future Manfred Mann singer Paul Jones, no relation, called The Roosters, ran an ad in London's Jazz News looking for like-minded musicians. Jones's replacement eventually in The Roosters was one Eric Clapton. 
Mick Jagger signed on first and after some initial reluctance brought along his school friend Keith Richards. Bassists and drummers various came and went until Bill Wyman was recruited on the basis of owning a spare amplifier and his own bass and having enough money to provide a regular supply of cigarettes and finally a prestigious recruit in the well-reputed Charlie Watts. This lineup received, as payment for its first gig together, the princely sum of half a crown, which would be about $50 in today's money. Even at the low rates the band commanded in 1962-63, Jones allegedly paid himself five pounds a week extra for all of the extra work that he had to do. Keith Richards still bitches about this today. In the early days, Jones was the driving force behind the band. He was the best musician, the most widely eclectic listener, except perhaps Watts, the hardest working, and frankly, the best at pulling chicks. Underneath this, he was, however, a deeply flawed and unpleasant individual, especially towards any girl unlucky enough to be caught in the web of his dubious charms. Linda Lawrence, mother of Jones's son Julian and later Mrs Donovan, suffered appallingly at his hands and fell into the cycle of many women in Jones's life, loving him dearly but dealing with his callousness, his abuse on every level and their own essential disposability. In April 1964, the Stones released their debut album on the back of a number three single in Not Fade Away, and with its all over now rising to number one along with the album, Jones was already buckling under the strain. With two extremely incompetent suicide bids, the second of which involved him hurling himself out of a first floor window, landing in a rather uncomfortable gorse bush and there waiting half an hour until a policeman found him. The debut album, as it happens, is a marvel, full on the whole of fire and wonderment, even if Jagger's vocals on Tell Me and Can I Get a Witness, a dubious selection, are on the wrong side of appalling. Jones in the Pockets Rhythms provides the band with supple yet powerful groove, and on the whole, it and the second album are complete vindications of Jones's vision for the band. With a UK and Australian number one album behind him, instead of consolidating, Jones became extremely paranoid. Spurred by the pressure of fame and the feeling that manager Andrew Lug Oldham was looking to break his grip on the band, and as Charlie Watts later opined, some pre-existing psychological issues. His drinking accelerated dramatically, as did his intake of whatever was put in front of him. Vices acquired on the first two American tours made matters very much the worst. The second album almost matched the first, this one full of leaner blues songs, which stood into stark contrast with the Jagger-advocated soul numbers. January 1965 saw the dawn of a golden run of the Rolling Stones, with singles like The Last Time, Satisfaction, Get Off My Cloud, 19th Nervous Breakdown, Paint It Black, Have You Seen Your Mother Baby, Mother's Little Helper, and Let's Spend the Night Together, consisting a string of records, four number ones, two number twos, a three and a four, plus an additional US number three with As Tears Go By, which Jones did not play on. While he basked in the glory of these records, it was, after all, his facility with getting a tune out of exotic instruments or the brutal sophistication of his guitar interplay with Richards, which made them distinctive, he began to find himself drifting towards a different pole. The drink and drugs were all too often leading to violent confrontations, especially when he felt strangers were pushing him for too much. But more damaging was the increasing conviction that since their third album, Out of Our Heads, Jones was becoming redundant in his own band, a musical accessory. He began to collect famous friends, gadabouting and drinking clubs, maintaining a heroic regimen of hash, LSD, mandrax and cocaine. He started missing sessions, which infuriated Jagger, and often when he did turn up, he was so wasted, he couldn't communicate. He still made valuable and under-acknowledged contributions, the recorder melody to Ruby Tuesday, the horn arrangement on We Love You, swathes of Mellotron washes over the Satanic Majesty's album, alto saxophone on the tomfoolery that became You Know My Name, Look Up My Number by the Beatles. He also played on Baby You're a Rich Man and played a thing called a vibraslap on Jimi Hendrix's All Along the Watchtower. You can hear it very clearly in the intro at the end of each of the opening three bars, but his 
physical and mental degeneration across 1966-67 was frighteningly swift and frightening to see. The third nail in Jones's coffin with the Rolling Stones was Anita Pallenberg. A classic 60s dilettante, she met the band in Munich in 1965 and Jones, being the only one who could speak German, started up a conversation which led to a two-year relationship. Initially, this benefited Jones greatly as Pallenberg inspired his confidence to expand the band's sonic palette and to explore his own musical direction. But it ended in disaster during a drug fueled vacation in Morocco, taken to escape the heat from the recent arrest of Jagger, Richards and Jones for drug possession, in which Jones punched Pallenberg in the face, and she fled into the arms of Jones's one time protege turned nemesis, Keith Richards. Jagger, Richards and Pallenberg then decamped to England, leaving Jones in Tangiers penniless and with a large hotel bill to pay. Richard now had a significant motivation to excise Jones from the band. La Bissier d'une femme volée. But the final nail was his drug bust. Jones's flat was raided and pot, meth and cocaine were found. After an arduous trial in which psychiatric reports and adverse character witnesses were produced, which reduced an extremely fragile Jones to tears, so much so that he was taken to hospital twice for nervous exhaustion, he was sentenced to nine months, Jagger and Richards having gotten originally one month each, and released pending appeal. In May 1968, in the middle of recording Beggar's Banquet, he was busted again. Facing 10 years in the jug, the judge took pity on Jones, letting him off with a nugatory fine and a warning that he would do the whole bid next time he was busted. He emerged from the experience an utterly broken man, a man who had lost everything that was important to him in life. He contributed to every track on Beggar's Banquet except Factory Girl and Salt of the Earth. His slide guitar part on No Expectations is one of the finest moments in the whole Stones catalogue. And in December's Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus, playing a beautiful Les Paul gold top, he looks focused, if captured a little low in the mix. The unkindest cut of all, though, was yet to come. In May 1969, after a cycle of increasingly bizarre behaviour, missed recording sessions and the final humiliation at the hands of Jagger, who, when, before recording, you can't always get what you want, Jones had asked, what can I play, replied with, I don't know, what can you play? Jagger and Richards drove out to Jones's house and told him sadly and in no uncertain terms that he had been dismissed from the band he had founded and that his vision had defined. Ostensibly, the reason was that the band could not tour the United States with Jones's drug conviction hanging over his head. It was also made clear that should any appeal be successful, he would still not be invited to resume with the band. According to accounts, Jones took the news as well as can be expected. Charlie Watts, who lived as a nearby neighbour, was a regular visitor, and Jagger made constant inquiries as to Jones's well-being. Jones himself cut back somewhat on his drink and drugs and busied himself overseeing renovation to his newly purchased house, which once belonged to A.A. Milne. It was there, horribly, in the swimming pool of that house from which Jones, a mere handful of weeks after his sacking from the Rolling Stones, was pulled drowned in the early hours of June 3rd, 1969. Watson Jagger recoiled in horror, although only Watts attended the funeral, at the death of the man who was once their friend and once their mentor. Wild rumours abounded and resurfaced from time to time that Jones was murdered by one of his builders, Frank Farragut, who, along with a few others, had taken to a parasitic existence stealing from Jones. But that makes no sense. Why kill a goose that lays the golden egg? The Rolling Stones had already done that. The Hyde Park gig went ahead, Jones was duly eulogised, Mick Taylor was anointed into the band and the American tour pressed ahead. Five months later, the Stones had traded the blissed-out hippie heaven of Hyde Park for the swirling maelstrom of hell within the ultimate speedway. Instead of swarms of white butterflies being unleashed, the Furies came bolting from the box the Stones opened that night. Electo, the wild fury of a post-Manson, post-Tet American youth. Mega Era, the wild, jealous rage of crazed Meredith Hunter. 
and Tisiphone, the destruction wrought upon him by the Hell's Angels. And as Alan Passeros's knife plunged twice into Hunter's back, and Hunter fell beneath a torrent of further blades, clubs, and crushing boots, the Rolling Stones played under my thumb, and the 1960s were over. <laughs> 